identity politics. It's a phrase that's made its way around the left and the right. The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein is famous for his view about how linguistic misunderstandings define the scope of philosophical problems and ethical problems. If there is anyone who understands how communication between people often goes awry, it's definitely him. Wittgenstein writes, For a large class of cases, though not for all, in which we employ the word meaning, it can be defined thus. The meaning of a word is its use in the language. This is Ludwig Wittgenstein, Philosophische Untersuchungen, or Philosophical Investigations, section 43. This is an important point, as it shows that the meaning of a word is in the mouth of the speaker. I mean, a fella's name on first base. Who? The fella playing first base. Who? The guy on first base. Who? I'm asking you who's on first. Who? That's what I'm asking you. Nothing will ever be funnier than misunderstandings. With regard to identity politics, this phrase has both right-wing and left-wing speakers. But before our descent into dilemmas arising from politicized linguistic confusion, our first step will be to define our terms. The dictionary says, Identity politics, a noun. Political activity or movements based on or catering to the cultural, ethnic, gender, racial, religious, or social interests that characterize a group identity. So there we have it. Identity politics. It is loved and detested on both sides of the political spectrum. Hence, we must further break down how it is used on each side of that spectrum. In this piece, we shall first start with the political right. On his appearance with Bill Maher on Real Time, Jordan Peterson said that the problem with the left is that they are too saturated with identity politics. Peterson is well known for his dislike of identity politics. In a conversation with Dave Rubin on his book tour, he said, And the left plays collective identity games, the radical left, and the right plays collective identity games. The left is, left's game is guilt on the part of the majority, and the right's game is, well, to hell with that. If we're going to play identity politics, then my damn group is going to win. And I think the whole game is reprehensible. So for Peterson, it's just a game played by both the left and the right. Interesting. How does the game start? Who has historically been winning that game? The answers to these questions are nowhere to be found or considered by Peterson. We'll get to that later, but first, let's examine identity politics in light of the lexicographical description previously mentioned. So, people are engaging in political movements according to their identity. This seems rather easy to understand, but let's take apart these right-wing criticisms. Breitbart writer Neil Monroe said in an article regarding Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's victory over Joe Crowley, Donald Trump was elected by mobilizing national opposition to this nation-changing identity politics trend. So, according to the Breitbart article, Donald Trump was elected by mobilizing national opposition to this nation-changing trend of political activity or movements catering to the interests that characterize a group identity. Okay, got it. However, there is a problem that sticks out for me in this regard. And it's a word. Catering. What does it mean to cater? Isn't all politics catering on some level? Let's explore this a bit. Was the Civil Rights Act of 1964 catering, or was it a huge step in the right direction for civil rights and U.S. labor law in the United States, which outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin? The implication is that identity politics is merely special interests among a populace. But a populace is a mass of people with different interests who live in different conditions, is it not? The larger context of Monroe's piece is the titular claim 
that Democrats' identity politics defeats establishment Joe Crowley. Monroe notes that the demographic shift of New York's 14th district, which is now half Latin American, is what made Ocasio-Cortez win. He says, her race and ethnicity pitch to Latin American migrants was front and center on her Twitter account. I guess it's not particularly surprising that this was somewhat the case for Ocasio-Cortez given the demographics of her district, but is this really identity politics? If there are issues that disproportionately affect certain people, would it not make sense to organize around that? Ocasio-Cortez is Puerto Rican and supports the abolition of ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, an organization involved in separating mostly Latin American children from their families. But so does New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who isn't Latina. Clearly, this issue can share some common ground beyond those who would likely be affected by it. If you do come into a majority and you have a significant number, or at least an influence, of people who have that kind of a position. Yeah. Well, I agree with it. I don't think ICE today is working as intended. But well, you think I you believe, should get rid of the agency? I believe that it has become a deportation force. Um, and I think you should separate the criminal justice from the immigration issues. And I think you should reimagine ICE under a new agency with a very different mission and take those two missions out. And so we believe that we should protect families that need our help, and that is not what ICE is doing today, and that's why I believe you should get rid of it, start over, reimagine it, and build something that actually works. But it actually gets worse, because Ocasio-Cortez did not just define her political outlook by catering to the interests of Latin American people living in that district. In this tweet, she is criticizing the violence on May 15th at the Gaza border in which over 60 Palestinians were killed and thousands more wounded. She says, this is a massacre. I hope my peers have the moral courage to call it such. No state or entity is absolved of mass shootings of protesters. There is no justification. Palestinian people deserve basic human dignity as anyone else. Democrats can't be silent about this anymore. It is clear that her political outlook goes beyond her identity. She's not Palestinian. Is she catering to Palestinians? Or is she genuinely outraged at the grotesque violence exercised by the Israel Defense Forces? It's hard to tell. However, if you are in a context where your identity has a role in framing the social experiences you are likely to have, why not vote along those lines? especially if you're marginalized in that context. And what about the people who are not affected by those issues? Do we examine their tendency to vote in the opposite direction, largely ignoring issues that will likely not affect them? But that's the thing. It is usually the minority groups whose integrity is questioned in this regard. The dominant group is taken to be the norm, voting outside the tribalism ascribed to the minority group without race, without sexual orientation, without gender, without identity. As if the members of said group maintain a political god's eye view and the ver <coughs> as if the members of said group maintain a political god's eye view on the issues facing other people. Vox's David Roberts has a very thought provoking piece on this issue, which is linked in the description box below. But this, I must say, is another problem with the right-wing perspective on identity politics. The historical track record of the socially dominant group is taken for granted as normal, as intrinsic. It just is the way it is. However, one can clearly see that tribalism easily subsumes the consciousness of the dominant group. Pictured are the results of the Alabama Senate race in 2017, in which Doug Jones won against Roy Moore. As you can see, white men voted for Jones at a rate of 26%, white women 34%, black men 
93%, and black women, 98%. For Roy Moore, white men voted for him at a rate of 72%, white women, 63%, black men, 6%, black women, 2%. Is it really an accident that 98% of black women in Alabama voted against Moore? Are they playing identity politics? Or are they voting against the conditions that Roy Moore would create for them? Keep in mind that Roy Moore is a slavery apologist and a serial sex offender. In light of these facts, does it really surprise you that black women would have the lowest level of support for this man? Roy Moore also thinks that homosexuality should be illegal. Without a doubt, his support would be less than a percent among black LGBT women living in Alabama. Is that identity politics? Many on the right simply use it as a slur to imply that those engaging in it, usually minorities, are simply voting as a tribe without any regard to policies. The reality is that Female black voters are resisting the identity politics of a racist and misogynistic sex offender. But beyond that, when compared to Roy Moore, Doug Jones's policies are better for Alabamians as a whole. The irrationality is on the part of the dominant group, in this case white Alabamian men, which wants to uphold its social status at the expense of that of other groups. This brings me to my main critique of the conservative understanding of identity politics. The real identity politics is the identity politics of the oppression. All else is secondary. When it comes to race in America, the real identity politics is the identity politics of redlining. It's the identity politics of predatory lending. It's the identity politics of racially motivated urban planning, of lynching, slavery, scientific racism, Jim Crow, slave codes, stigmatizing black women's hair as a sexual distraction, segregation, systemically impoverished neighborhoods, voter suppression, the drug war, the destruction of black Wall Street, human experimentation, and human zoos. These events have effects that still exist. However, do right-wingers acknowledge these realities? Barely, if at all. Often, for them, the benchmark for white identity politics is taken to be Richard Spencer, Jason Kessler, and David Duke. Everything short of that is just fine. When right-wingers attack the left for using identity politics, it's nothing more than a talking point used to paint minorities as irrationally voting based on skin color or some arbitrary characteristic rather than the policies that will disproportionately affect them in certain ways while also helping the society as a whole. For the right, it's a pathetic attempt to preserve the status quo and keep people from realizing how society is already biased towards certain people. I believe there are universal solutions to fixing a society that is biased against certain people. However, this is the main point. Acknowledging that people have used and continue to use race, gender identity, and other characteristics to marginalize people is just a fact. And as we all know, facts don't care about your feelings. Now, it would be unfair for me to end the piece without acknowledging that such people do exist in leftist circles. They do, and such people should be condemned in some cases. However, it's not just these crazy extremists. In the next video, I will talk about identity politics as it pertains to the left and the problems associated with narrow-focused voting. This will draw upon certain conversations that are currently taking place within left-wing circles. It should function as a way to craft a path forward for a more holistic and sane left while still acknowledging the issues that disproportionately affect certain people.